to go to Japan, it was like, it was like hand to hand combat. It's like nobody, you, you know, you body slam the guy and he's standing there before you, you can even bend over and pick him up. And he's, you know, that was the hard part for me, was wrestling guys that were in better shape than you, like in Japan. Because you were just nowhere near, especially in the beginning, you were just not in the shape to, they could just, no matter how long it took, it took 15 minutes, they could, by the 15 minute mark, I remember my tongue would be hanging down with my shoelaces. And I'm like, I can't keep fighting this guy because I'm getting run out of gas. And I would run out of gas, and then these Japanese guys would take over on you because you couldn't really, you're, you run out of gas. I don't know if you ever run out of gas physically in any sport. But when you run out of gas, you run out of gas. There's nothing left. You can't defend yourself. You know, they're body slamming you, and they're drop kicking you in the face, and they're suplexing you. I just remember it was, it was really hard slog wrestling in Japan. And you'd go there for a six week tour. For the first three weeks, you'd fight hand to hand combat every night. And he, these guys to get really bummed out with shit. Uh, I just want to have a good match with somebody. They, they want to, nobody's selling for me. I body slam them, they get right back up and act like nothing ever happened. And it was just really tough to, to, to wrestle those guys. But I, and I will say that every tour I ever went on, and we were always the foreign tour with the international wrestlers that like, like, ever wrestled from Germany and one from England. United States. I was always the token Canadian guy. And the Japanese wrestlers were super fit and very tough guys. And they just decide they're not going to sell for you. They're not going to do stuff for you. And you start struggling through these matches. And you go through about three weeks of wrestling like that, of a six-week tour. And literally every night is like hand-to-hand -hand combat. And then it's like about three weeks into it, you start to feel like you're getting in pretty good shape. Now your, your cardio is getting up because you've been fighting with these guys for so many weeks. And suddenly it's like the, the second half of the tour, the Japanese guys like want to start taking the news. Let's, let's cooperate. Now let's cooperate. And it's like, no, the cooperating is done. <laughs> and your ass is mine now. <laughs> and that's, that was the beauty of Japan is that you, you know, you had to, take a lot of shit for about three weeks until you get your cardio up and get where you can start fighting these guys for real. And, uh, and then it was like on the last half of the tour, it was like completely the other way around, where you're giving them back exactly what they did to you, and you're not cooperating with anybody on anything, and you're just the most difficult guy to work with. And you know, then you go back a few months later and you go through the whole thing again. But Japanese wrestling was, you know, the thing about Japanese wrestling was that the top guys like Antonio Inoki and Fujinami and Tiger Mask, I don't know. Tiger Mask! But all these guys were so good. They were the best, in the world. they were as good as anybody in the world. They were so good and they were always easy to work with. Antonio Inoki was a fantastic wrestler, one of the best wrestlers ever. But the guys that you had to work on with getting to Fujinami and Inoki and these guys, those guys were tough really hard to wrestle and uh, I just will say that when I wrestled in Japan I earned every penny I ever made over there. It was like the hardest wrestling I ever did. Uh, who would you consider underrated? Underrated uh, Barry Horowitz. Woo! Yeah. Barry Horowitz and Shrew Yeah. I think the Bill Goldberg and I'm going to go on a big thing about Bill Goldberg. Oh. Yeah. 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 Less deserving of being in any wrestling hall of fame. Yeah, right. He is the single worst, most dangerous, lousiest wrestler I've ever been able to Yeah. He was the shit for work with, he was shit for wrestling. And every time he wrestled the he, he had zero sense of what wrestling was. He seemed to think that if you kick somebody as hard as you could, that was okay. Body slammed somebody through the floor. You know, he was unprofessional. He never said, I remember Bill Goldberg said to me a few years after he hurt me, he said something to me about, um, he goes, you know, it's the nature of the business. And I always remember it stuck in my head, like, no, it's, it's not the nature of the business. It's the opposite. The nature of the business is to never hurt the guy you work with. It's, to be a, it's a show to a really 
well orchestrated show to make you think it's real, but nothing out there is really real. Like you're not really hurting each other. I'm, I made the comparison earlier tonight about uh, it's like figure skating. It's like we're telling a story, but nobody's supposed to get hurt. When you're coming back to the dressing room every night and you're hurt every night wrestling somebody, he's doing it. Somebody's doing it wrong. Like you're not supposed to come back and be hurt, like for real. And Bill Goldberg. I can honestly say, I think he heard every single wrestler that I ever worked with. Like he was, you know, he didn't seem to understand that wrestling's a show and that you, you know, it's all pretend and you're not really winning these titles. You're not winning 5,000 matches in a row with a perfect record. It's <laughs> real. These guys are all just allowing you to, they're building you up. You know, I don't think Bill Goldberg ever understood that stuff, but. And saying that, Barry Horowitz, who was uh, just a Saturday morning, you know, guy that lost in the most matches he ever had, and all this stuff, always gave a good match. Never heard one guy that he ever worked with. They should put him in the Hall of Fame. Yeah. They should take Bill Goldberg's. Woo! This is an interesting question. Uh, I'm assuming it, it's excluding. I'm assuming it's excluding your work. But if you were to make a training visit video to represent what wrestling is to you, is there two or three matches that you could draw from that you would say, yeah, that's it, they get it, they're doing it right? Well, I think, um, you know, it's all, like when I watch the, my favorite matches of my career are um, the Iron Man match with Shawn Michaels, Stone Cold match that we just watched, and probably, I believe with Bulldog. Oh, yeah. Maybe I'll run WrestleMania 10 and maybe Undertaker SummerSlam 97. I had so many great matches that I really loved working with the guys I worked with. And it's just it's just that ability to, I think the best, best, um, what helped me the most be become the great wrestler that I like to think I was, was that I was a great fan first. And watching, when I was a little kid, when I was six, seven, eight years old, watching Sorry. these, these guys right. tell their stories and back right. in the old days. It's um, all right. well, I learned a lot watching how wrestling should be, the stories, the stories should be told. And uh, in that sense, I had a better education than a lot of wrestlers. Cause, I grew up with it all my life and understood it. Whether I knew it or not, I understood it. When I was like 16 years old, I had been educated about wrestling and had a really, probably a deep understanding of how it really worked. And uh, being from the Calgary or this territory, my dad's territory. You know, there was Gene Kineski, there was Whipper Watson, there was Luz Dez, there was all these champion wrestlers that came through Calgary. And Calgary was a place where the, the territory anyway were world class wrestlers competed in, in Western Canada at Edmonton and in all these towns. Pat O'Connor, Luthez, Buddy Rogers, you can name them all. They, they, they all worked for my dad. And, uh, but you know, I was educated as a little kid, six, seven years old, sitting in the front row watching those guys. And uh, so I had a really good education as a and I think that helped me um, put together matches. And I think, um, I don't think anybody told better stories than I did in wrestling. Like the Iron Man match with Shawn Michaels, that was for sure the hardest match I ever had. And um, you lost. It, was a case, it was a case of, um, you know, Shawn uh, was so in shape and so, you know, they, they had designed it where, like, they had really run me into the ground going into WrestleMania where I had no chance to, to build my cardio. I was wrestling, at the time, I was wrestling Undertaker, I think Yokozuna and Psycho Sid, which are all big guys that are 6'5 or whatever. And it's like, um, you know, you can't build cardio with those kind of guys. You know, if they'd stuck me with all one and Mr. Perfect and uh, Davey or some different guys, I could build my cardio up. But I was designed going into that match with uh, Shawn Michaels to not look good. Like, we don't want him being 
We don't want him outshining Sean or looking better than Sean. This is going to be Sean's fault. And it was designed in a way to make sure that whatever happened, Sean got over. And um, I remember thinking that I have to make sure that I get ready for this match. So I would write, I, on, on my wrestling schedule, I started doing cardio in the gyms and on the stationary bikes and stuff like that. Where I worked for maybe a month before the match, really worked on my cardio because they were purposely making sure that I couldn't build my cardio up. And I, I really just did everything I could to make sure I was ready for that match. And what happened that day was, it was supposed to be the Shawn Michaels show. And it was going to be the Shawn Michaels show, whether I liked it or not. But I mean, what it was, was it was the Shawn Michaels show, plus it was the Red Heart show. Because I looked as strong and as good as, and, and, and it was a, it was definitely a match where Shawn was supposed to be scraping me off the mat for 60 minutes and looking like, a, looking like the champion, really. But we, that's why he's the big guy. And I made the, by, Prepared myself better. I made sure that it's still the Shawn Michaels show, but it, Bret Hart's still here too. And, uh, that was always my success. And the Stone Cold uh, WrestleMania 13 was again. We've kind of talked about that, but it was a case of two guys understanding that they were going to switch places somehow. And in the subtleties of how we did that change, where Steve was the good guy at the end of it, and I was the bad guy, is. Probably my greatest, you know, that was like maybe my my most uh, greatest experience as a wrestler that I can sort of show anybody about how good I was. I always think you could you could put a UFC fight on, put any UFC fight on, and to entertain yourself about how good a fight. And real fights are real fights, and there's great drama in real fights. And uh, and then it's like you can watch any great UFC fight. Talk about how great it was, or what a great watch this party here. But you know, like I don't think that there are any. I've never seen a UFC fight that was better than the one that I had with Steve Austin. And it's like, and the beauty of the match with Steve Austin is uh, no animals were harmed in the making of that movie. <laughs> it was, uh, you know, there's a lot of people don't understand how how wrestling works sometimes. But I remember in the match with uh, Steve. I remember telling Steve before we went out, I said, the key to this match is if you if we had blood in the match. You and the sharpshooter and the blood coming down this it's it'll make you forever. I remember telling him that. And he was like and Steve said to me, he goes, I've never done it before. I've never ever got blood in a match in my life. And um, he goes, I, I don't know how to do it, but I'll sure as hell try. I'll give it a shot. I told him, I said, you don't want to experiment or practice at WrestleMania. <laughs> and I remember I told him, because one of the first rules you ever learn in wrestling is never let anybody cut you in wrestling. It's like the first rule I ever learned is like, don't ever let anyone, because you're always like, oh, I'm too scared to do it myself. I'll let you do it for me, and then the guy takes off half your head. You know? so, so you learn, like, don't ever let anyone do that to you. And I ever said that to Steve that day in the dress room. I said, First thing I ever learned was the first thing to never let anyone catch it, but I'm telling you, Steve, do you want to practice at WrestleMania? Let me do it. And, you know, it's kind of a funny moment in that match. Of course, I know you all just watched it a few minutes ago, but there's a part in that match where I'm, I remember I told Steve, I said, if you, because we could get into a lot of trouble for having blood in a match when we weren't supposed to, but now uh, I told Steve, I said, if you, Got a problem with it? You want to cancel it? And we don't do it. We don't do it. And you just tell me. I said, well, once I have the razor in my hand, believe it or not, I carried it in my mouth. You know, it's a little tiny. You make it kind of small with a little handle. It's like a just a regular Gillette razor blade that you cut into pieces. And I remember I put it in my mouth right here, and I carried it in my in my lip the whole match. Wow. All the moves that we're doing, and you think small with a razor blade would kill you. You just make sure you don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I remember I told Steve, I said, once I spit it out and I get it in my hand, I said, just don't turn it back. Like we were going, we're 
full steam ahead then. And I remember I said, if you want to cancel it, you have to tell me before I get it in my hand. And there's one part of that match where um, where he sidesteps me and throws me out of the ring. And I remember he, as we were doing it, I said, are we, are we doing it? Or like, and he goes, yeah, okay, well, let's do it. And it's like, okay, we're doing it. And I sidestepped me and he threw me out on the floor. And I landed on the floor and I spit it out and I had it in my hand. And Steve drops down on the floor and then he goes, maybe we better not. <laughs> <laughs> and so if you're watching that match and you're like, as he's reversing, as I'm reversing, I start to throw him into the fence or the railing there. I'm yelling in Steve's ear as loud as I can. I'm going, it's too late. <laughs> 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 and Steve hit the fence, uh, the railing, but it's just, I always thought if you, you know, if I can turn you on a little bit, but it's like, we weren't allowed to have blood in the match, it's like Vince McMahon's there, on the announcer table, I throw Steve into the railing, I walk over and I grab him by the chin, and jerk him like where I got over there, so I remember, I knew I had to hold his hand, make sure he didn't get nervous or something. <laughs> <laughs> that can be dangerous for him. And uh, anyway, it was just the most perfect cut that I made on Steve Austin. It was about the size of a dime. And if you ever watch that match, you can see it sometimes when he wipes the blood off. It's just a little tiny cut on his forehead. But I did it in front of the entire um, Chicago arena, whatever it was. Everybody in the building was watching me, and they never saw me cut his forehead. And that's what kind of pro I was. I, I did it like, so um, so I never told anybody. Nobody ever knew. Everyone thought it was real um, for a long time. Like probably till I wrote my book. Everybody thought Steve that that was one match where Steve hit his head on the railing. And that's like in the end I wrote about it in my book. It was like. No, I did that, and, and, and I did it with such a good um, professionalism. Like, you know, it was just so well done that I, I was, uh, and I know that that match wouldn't be what it is today if it wasn't blood in that match. And if Steve had chickened out and we didn't do it, it would have been a mistake for him. That was what ultimately made Steve Austin was that blood in that match. And uh, I was always glad to give him Steve that match. Sadly, you know, wrestling fans of, of my age, we've lost so many superstars and so many pro wrestlers that we've loved for so many years. Why are we so fortunate to be able to sit here with you today? What lifestyle changes, Sorry. lifestyle decisions, and choices did you make that allow you to be here at the age you are? Well, <clears throat> I wasn't I wasn't bad I uh, have nothing to be ashamed of or anything, but a lot of wrestlers, I believe anyway, I mean maybe I'm wrong, but I believe that a lot of wrestlers got into taking pain pills. Not because they were in so much pain, but because it was a crutch that they were drinking or anything else. And I think for me, it's just uh, it's just a case of um, you know genetics, maybe, or just the way you're, the way I'm programmed. I, I was not a guy that um, I was not very self-destructive, but there were so many wrestlers that I believe anyway that took a lot of pills to mask the pain that they had. But really, I think the pain they had was being away from. Uncertain about where their futures were, and not knowing what kind of um, where their next house payments going to be, investments. You know, because wrestlers, when you start out, you know, you're just a wrestler like you and me. When I start out in WWF, suddenly you're making more money than you've ever made in your whole life ever before, and it's it's short lived. It's like you're making this money. And you're working 300 days a year, and they're grinding everything out of you. You're wrestling in different cities, in different time zones. And, you know, it's easy to get into a habit of taking pills and um, 
to mask the pain and, and the loneliness, you know. I'm not going to make excuses for myself, or, but I know that when I was, I probably would, when I was in WWF, we went through the cocaine phase. Where everybody was doing cocaine from basketball players to football players to rock stars and everybody. Cocaine was everywhere. And, um, you know, I, I did my share of cocaine. Um, it was, it was, it was a novelty. It was like, it was the cool thing to do back then. It was like the, the drug that can't, you know, can't do wrong. It was like, but you know, you, you learn. I remember it was like you back off and I remember the guys that were all doing cocaine that ended up with serious cocaine problems. There was a point in time where I had enough sense to, um, to know that um, the lifestyle was, was dangerous for all of us. And um, I just know for me that um, cocaine and pills and all the stuff that was kind of going on, that I was better off with um, other vices. Like I, <clears throat> I think that um, what saved me, what probably during most of those days was that um, I just, um, you know, I, I went for the girls. So, <laughs> both, uh, girls and stuff. I remember telling a girl I'd go to sit at a table and, uh, and I'd see the wrestlers and the, the drug dealers. And all I knew them all and I was part of the whole system and the whole sort of mentality of it. And it's like I could see them getting together and they're, they're, and they're all going to go up to a room and they're going to have a cocaine fest up there and it's like, and I'd be sitting with a girl in the bar and, like, and I would tell her, I would say, look, you know, in a few minutes these guys are going to come over and they're going to try to talk me into going up to the room to, to you know, I said, whatever happens, don't let me go. Do not let me go up in that room and make out that we're together. And, we're, and I remember I would say that a lot of times. And then the wrestlers would gravitate over to me and it's like, come on up. And it's hard to explain, but I know that to say this is that if I didn't go up in the room, I would lose my position. Like you weren't part of the in click. You weren't part of that. Once you said, no, I'm good, I'm not going to be part of that, you were like on a blacklist of like, don't call him to party with him because he's, he's on the blacklist. And so, but if you had a girl, it was like, you got a pass. Like, what girl, what idiot would not would go up and do a bunch of cocaine when he could be with a girl? It's like, and I remember it kind of saved me. And, I love you, love your honesty. You know, I don't know. I love you, uh, I don't know that it makes me a good role model or a good person. I think, I think, I'm just saying, I think uh, the fact that I steered away from the drugs and was more of a womanizer, I'd probably say. Yeah. 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 You're a womanizer, please, right? Yeah. 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 Those guys would like to be doing, but you just have the opportunity, that's all. Um, so, I, I, I just want to, we've got to wrap this thing up. Um, I'd like to thank Brett, I'll tell you what, we're supposed to be done here at Cannes, and I was saying to Brett earlier, you know, this is Tug on your ear if you're done, and we'll wrap this thing up. He never talked about his ear one time. So uh, he's been a great sport. Uh, thanks to our friend from the Bear Yukon, Jack, for being part of the show here tonight. Let's hear it for him. And this time, Brent. One last question that we want to end uh, on, on this note, and you know, this has been great. You've been very honest. People don't people don't come to these things and ask questions and then hope that the guy kind of bullshits them all night. This has been very uh, interesting, and thank you for sharing your honest stories with us here. Um, but I want to end everything with one last question. If you if you were to look back, Brett, on an absolutely unbelievable career that's had its ups and downs. What would be the one thing that you would say that you're you're the most proud of? Of absolutely anything that you ever I know there's a lot, but what could you name one thing to close the show tonight? 
Um, for sure, it would be the fact that I never heard of one wrestler ever. That's my truly biggest claim to be the best there is, the best there was, the best there will be. <laughs> When you body slam somebody and you know he he's lying there on the mat and you go over to the second rope or step through and you climb up on the top uh, on the apron and you climb up on the top turnbuckle, the reality is the guy that's lying on the floor in the ring has to put all his trust, everything, all his faith in you that you are going to climb up on the top turnbuckle and you're going to jump off with a knee drop or whatever you're going to do on him and that you're not going to hurt him. And that he's got to lie there and trust you and believe you that you are not going to hurt him, that you're not going to fuck up and break his neck or to hurt him really bad. And that's a responsibility and a trust that the wrestler puts in you as a performer. And, you know, I think it was because of the fact that my dad was a promoter and, you know, it was important for my dad to make sure his wrestlers uh, could wrestle again the next day kind of thing. It was a, it's a business. And I always understood that safety. When I got taught, I got taught by two Japanese wrestlers, Mr. Hito and Mr. Sakurata, um, that wrestled for my dad. But the very first thing I learned in wrestling was that the most important thing is your opponent, not, not you. Like if you're gonna fall, it's okay if you hurt yourself, but you can never hurt the guy you're working with. Like his, his safety is your priority. It's the most important thing. If you blow your own knee out or you break your own arm or you hurt yourself by doing something, that's on you. But the guy that's in the ring, he's put all his trust in you. He's got no safe. You have to make sure you're safe and you have to make sure whatever you do that you didn't hurt him because he's put all his faith in you. He's just going to lie there. He knows you're not going to hurt him. And when you jump off and you do hurt him, like Bill Goldberg throw me in the ropes. Oh, you know, when you throw me in the ropes, you have to, I have to trust you. I'm coming off the ropes. I heard Bill Goldberg, he told me, he said, watch out for the kick. I'm going, kick, what kind of kick? I don't even know what kind of kick he's talking about. I'm coming off the ropes and he decides to do a backwards mule kick with no idea where he's throwing his feet or how hard he's throwing his like He could go to kick the brick out of a wall. He was so steroided up. <laughs> it's like, um, it's oh, damn. Um, it's roasting Goldberg I'm tonight. But it's just so much, it's, I had all the tr trust and faith in the world. I'm coming off the ropes. It's just going to be a, I thought it was going to be a kick in the stomach, to be honest. And it was like a golf swing, like somebody swinging a golf club at you, hitting you as hard as they can in the, in the head. It's like, that's not how you do it. That's not, that's, that makes you fail. You, you failed as a person. Fair enough. Fair enough. Well, thank you. I want to thank Anthony and Raymond and everybody here at the Century Casino. Uh, this was first class all the way. Again, thanks to God. Thank you, Brett. Thank Great. you, Brett. And, uh, The only way I know how with a little good old fashioned head whaler from Stanley Russell. I'll just say this. In the meantime, and in between time, that's it. Hopefully, the not last edition of An Evening with WWE legend Brent the Hitman Hart. <laughs> to happen. It was something that I, had, I was looking forward to, looking forward to it about two years ago. Yeah. <laughs> two <laughs> years! I'm so glad everybody came out and you were patient and you waited and I, I appreciate it very much. Thank you. Thank you.